Yeah, we're back. This is Think Tech. This is Think Tech Live. I'm Jay Fidel here at the 12 o'clock block on a given Thursday. And uh, we're talking about transportation and transit um, and how we can save it from the ravages of COVID, which is affecting it. Okay, for this fab fabulous analysis, uh, we have Anu Hiddle, and she's a researcher, an adjunct researcher at the East West Center, uh, especially environment, especially climate change. Hi, Anu. How are you? I'm good, Jay. How are you? Thank you for having me here. Good. Thanks for joining us. So let's talk about it. I mean, you know, somebody has to be thinking about this because the paradigm has shifted. You know, up until COVID, we had certain specific ideas about our community and how we wanted to design it and all these progressive, if not visionary ideas for improving Hawaii and, and transit and transportation in Hawaii. Um, now we have to take another look at it. Uh, so what look should that be? So Jay, I'm uh, coming at this from obviously a climate change perspective. We've been trying to push transportation. It's one of the fastest growing and is the largest emissions uh, sector that's emitting greenhouse gases. And that's a problem. So how do we, you know, the energy sector, the, the power sector, if you will, uh, that's, uh, we've got that, um, we've got a nice, the renewable portfolio standard for that in Hawaii and in other places, but nationwide and in Hawaii, we are finding that transportation is a very uh, big and actually the leading growth um, sector for emissions. And, yeah, so, and don't forget, and don't forget that transportation is one of the most expensive things um, you can do. Its development is very expensive. Its development is expensive, but you know, everything it, that way could be expensive. It's just, um, uh, I think that we are looking at, well, pre-pandemic, we were trying to push, uh, make a push for mass transit, for walking, biking, pedestrian, all of those kinds of things. Um, Multimodal, and, multimodal, right? Wasn't oh my, those are big words. Where'd you find those? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have them tattooed on the inside of my eyeballs. But but the question, the question is, right, uh, so, is multimodal over? Right. So is multimodal over, and is has the pandemic struck a nail in the coffin of multimodal? Right. So you know what H one used to look like, or maybe you you don't go on H one, but H one used to be a parking lot before the pandemic. So now imagine. Imagine that the pandemic is over, over, and we've got nobody wanting to get into any kind of shared, uh, unsocially distanced, is that a word, socially not distanced, <laughs> whatever. So there's no social, perceived no social distancing. It seems like this would, these would be COVID hubs, basically, in a bus or, uh, of course, walking, you could walk alone, but then again, you've got narrow sidewalks. How do you keep social distance, bike trails? non-existent, basically, bike paths. Uh, how do you get to work? How do you get to your grocery store, et cetera, right? So when you have a pandemic, something like a pandemic, and you put pressure on a system, you put pressure on any system, then the cracks appear, right? And here are the cracks. So what's that going to look like when we get back to normal? Or some people want to call it a better normal. Well, I think before you, before you use a, a word like normal, you have to qualify what you mean by that because normal is not gonna be the way it was. Let me, let me digress to tell you a short story about uh, our life here at ThinkTech uh, 10, 15 years ago. It was on the radio, Hawaii Public Radio, and uh, Jack uh, Balkan, who's the Dean of Constitutional Law uh, at Yale, uh, was on the show. And we had a post-show conversation with him. It was the time of uh, W in office, Bush. And I said to him, you know, Jack, um, can we go back? Can we go back to the normal that existed before Bush? Because, you know, he's, he's, he's undermined a few important things. And uh, we'd like to get back, like a yo-yo, you know, just go right, as soon as he's out of office, we'll go back and do it the way we did it before and feel better. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. If you look at the evolution of the species as history, um, it's, it's never going back because everything that happens it's complex. Human, human evolution is very complex. And there are many events that take place. And so all those events have an effect on the line of history. Sure. Um, and and there will be, never go back. 
Correct. And there won't be the same normal. It'll be a different normal, but uh, no doubt about that. So whenever we get to that different normal, what's H1 going to look like? That's been on my mind. And H1 is going to look like a parking lot because before that it looked like a parking lot. Only this time it's going to be a long-term parking lot <laughs> because people are going to get out of the buses and get back into cars. So already transit ridership nationwide and in Honolulu have been declining, you know, pre-pandemic even. So we've been sort of putting our heads together and I've been thinking about this and how do you, I'm here to tell you that there is a way to make people move from one place to the other and to do it in a pandemic proof way without getting in your single occupancy vehicle, meaning one person, one car. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have some thoughts on that. And I've been, I mean, that's pretty safe though. One person, one car, if you really want to be uptight about it, wear a mask in the car by yourself alone in the car. Right, except you might go nowhere, right? So the cost of congestion of sitting in traffic is huge. Yeah, It's in the billions of dollars, okay, in, yeah. in nationwide. The yeah. cost of congestion, the cost of lives, of injury. So I was just reading that there's been a study done in Massachusetts looking at the Massachusetts car vehicle economy. And uh, basically that economy is about $64 billion a year billion okay and i'll put that billion in context in a, it's one uh, state it's one state it's a big state it has a lot of vehicles but 64 billion dollars and i'll put it in a global context in a second here of that more than half is borne by the public those vehicle costs of that of that vehicle economy through their state budget through injuries deaths congestion uh, I mean, you name it, right? So, so there is a huge cost. It's just we've taken it into consideration. It's become um, a cost that's become invisible. It's like our flu deaths. You know, we've got forty thousand flu deaths a, a year. We've got forty thousand annually nationwide um, traffic deaths a year. Uh, that's okay, you know. So until we normalize how many deaths are acceptable from the pandemic and from these other things. I mean, that's what your back to normal will be at some point, right? We'll, we'll be okay with not seeing these numbers in the news. It'll be all right. There'll be people dying quietly in hospitals somewhere, right? You're starting that's to like, scare me, Anu. So this is meant to be scary. So, so the cost of a vehicle economy is great. And let me put that $64 billion in some context, a global context for you. So the Green Climate Fund, right? which us climate groupies, we like to follow. The Green Climate Fund is 100 billion a year, 100 billion. The Massachusetts, one state in the United States, that only one part of their economy is 64 billion alone. So that's, I mean, you know, the Climate Fund, all countries got together, decided climate's a priority, and they're putting in 100 billion a year. Okay, so these are huge costs. I mean, it's a small fund, but still, the vehicle economy is huge. So I think um, it's not that safe actually sitting in your car, you know, so, and it's not that cheap. So that's, that's my point with all of this. Okay, and okay. let's just, let's say, accept all of that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, uh, and again, the word normal is subject to interpretation, but um, where are we going on this? Uh, let, let's assume that there's a, a better life ahead in a year. And okay. that's not, that's not, I mean, I want to assure you that's not because we're going to have herd immunity. We're not going to have herd immunity. Right, um, we're waiting. That will be through a vaccine, probably. Herd immunity well, will be maybe, through a vaccine. Maybe, maybe we'll just get used to it, you know? Some people think that our lives are going to change and we're going to, we're going to build it in the way you were talking a minute ago. But, but let's assume that life is a little better. We, it's, not, it's no longer a deep breathing exercise. That's the wrong way to frame this a deep breathing exercise to deal with COVID um, that we sort of incorporated into our community, our lives. Mm -hmm. okay. What is transportation going to look like then? Right. Uh, so I'm here to say that the car economy is a very expensive economy. The pandemic is a great time to rethink how we spend our public monies and what we really want to do with our lives and how, and our quality of living, right? Quality of life. So um, so does that mean getting back in your, you know, grungy old bus to get to work? Uh, does it mean, you know, that you have to get into spandex and ride a bike? Does it mean that you, you know, wear, I don't know, whatever it is you want to wear, but, you know, 
sensible walking shoes to get to work. I mean, you know, what does this mean, right? It means that we have to give up certain things and think of a different way of living. But it's not actually that we're giving up. I think um, when you really look at the costs of the vehicle economy, and then you look at also for recovery, you're looking at where does your recovery dollar have the best return? So the ARA monies that were spent in the, the Recovery Act back in uh, 2008, uh, the lessons from that showed us that for every dollar that was spent on just highway growth, that there was more return if you put a dollar into trans transit or highway repair rather than new highways. Okay, so just one place that I was looking at. So it means that you actually create jobs faster if you put money in transit. Explain how that works. Well, you're, you're putting money in a place where um, basically you get more bang for your buck, right? So you put in your, your this, is, this is again, the cost of that vehicle economy, right? So if you're putting it in for one single driver, one car, that money you're not getting back in terms of uh, congestion in terms of air pollution, all of those costs, right? Um, and deaths and injuries versus transit. I mean, transit, a bus is a huge thing. If it collides with something, I mean, my, my family was in a bus crash. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to minimize, you know, there have been bus accidents and they've been lethal. But um, my daughter looked up and she said, what's going on? Because we are stopped. She had no idea that we had actually, we had actually crashed. <laughs> and and transit authority um, transit associations will tell you I forget the numbers now but transit uh, associations will tell you that these are uh, public transport is like ninety something percent more safe than ri riding in your car. Oh, sure, you never have a bus crash. That's why your daughter she was so surprised. <laughs> well, she's like, why are we stopped? She didn't even know that we had like bumped and crashed against something. So, so here, here I am. Let's take me. I'm, I'm your case study today. Um, so I, I, I need to get to work. Not as much. Well, I don't have to go to, as much. And I, and I would prefer not to take my car. I'll consider other things. I'll consider, you know, biking. That's a long shot, but uh, or walking. E-bike. You could do an uh, e-bike. Oh yeah, I could e-bike. Yeah, there you go. Um, and, you know, all kinds of other options, I mean, uh, and options that are uh, environmentally friendly options. Um, and, uh, but it rains once in a while, so I have to, you know, change my routine. And if, if I go on a bus, I'll be very concerned that the guy next to me will have COVID or otherwise, give, you, know, you know, spread some viral particles on me. So I um, want to stop you right there about buses and COVID, okay? You're going to be concerned that the guy next to you has this. So there is actually very little evidence that transit poses a risk of coronavirus outbreaks. So this is from an article in July, 2020, and it's Scientific American. Mm -hmm. And they basically are saying that there's very, very little evidence. And that's partly because, um, because there is a, a mandate to wear masks, there is the distancing and people are not in there as long as they are in places like gyms and restaurants and all of the other places where COVID clusters have emerged. So in Japan and France, both of these were um, studied. Uh, both of these found that they had very, very few, almost non-existent cases in a recent study in Paris. Uh, so a cluster is described as more than three cases that can be traced to a common event or venue, okay? Excluding transmission within, within households. In Paris, they found that none of the city's 150 coronavirus clusters from early May to early June originated on the city's transit systems. That was back in June, on June 4th. On July 15th, they did have some, they had four transport clusters identified in Paris. And that was accounting for roughly 1% of 386 total clusters. So very low. And when well, Japan went- I don't know, if you're on a bus, we're all jammed up, there's no seats. You're, you're not gonna be jammed from... up. You're not gonna be jammed up. You need to have social distancing. And that's a case for having more bus lanes so that you can have more frequent bus service. So you can move people, you know, the same amount of people, but you're just putting in more, the buses are coming around more often. And who wouldn't like that where the buses are coming around more often? Oh, so sure. 
So, so that's one thing is that it is not associated with coronavirus clusters. When Japan went back to opening up, they found that their clusters were actually coming from gyms, restaurants, bars, all of these places that we, we think maybe some of us think twice, but most of us have, you know, as soon as they open up, people go to these places, right? Well, we think the and, government must know something we don't know, but actually we know plenty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and to date, they've said that preliminary studies and data from Paris, Austria, Seoul, Hong Kong, Tokyo have not shown transits to be hotspots of coronavirus. Outbreaks. But you know, it's a perception thing. And it's the average person who has a, we call it an emotional reaction. And there are things you could do to make that person feel more comfortable. For example, I was suggesting to you before the show that if you open the windows as a regular matter, as well as social distancing and masks, if you open the windows and have some air come in there, if you put in special air conditioning right. with a right. flow of fresh air, I'm going to feel a lot better. Right. And so places like King County, they've put in these MERV 8 filters into their bus systems. Uh, places like Greece, um, they are making it mandatory for you to wear a mask. If you're taking a taxi or an Uber, you have to wear a mask and you have to have the windows open. So this is all fine while it's summertime. I'll be curious. And it's fine for a place like Honolulu almost year round. But I'd be curious to see what they do in the winter or if it's raining. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll wear my raincoat and sit here. I'll wear my, you know, I'll bundle up and sit here. So it's going to make us a little more hardy and fond of the outdoors, right? But I think these are all good points. So when you look at what the airlines are doing, for example, they're putting in those um, HEPA filters. And they, now those are more complicated filtration systems, right? Well, because they're not that? just. Well, that? these are just, they're taking the very, very small uh, particles and they're filtering those out and they're doing it very frequently. But airlines, you know, airplanes, don't forget, have to have their own system up in the air, right? So it's not like just a cooling or heating issue like we have in our buildings or in our buses or whatever. It's a so, recirculating system. Yeah. Well, it's its own system. It's its own independent system, right? It's up there in the air and it's going to do its thing. So it needs to be more complicated. Whereas on the ground, you know, you don't need all those sort of pressurized cabins, this and that. So you're just cooling the air or, and filtering to some extent. But for example, the, uh, like I was saying, the King County bus system, they put in these very high circulating filters and, um, you know, they've been, so the, so the filters are one thing, keeping your windows open is another, it may not be always practical. Um, but these are what jurisdictions are doing, and these are the lessons we're learning. And it's, it's anyway, these are things we should have been doing from the beginning, right? You should have good air quality. You should have a life where you have good air quality. Why yeah. should you get into a, and why should you get into a, to a, you know, to a bus where your health is at stake? Yeah, I mean, it could just be the flu that you would get from your next person over. But ultimately, it's a matter of incentivizing people. And I'm reminded that for a while, not, not, more recently, but for a while, the buses, public buses uh, in the big island were free. You want to take a bus ride? Hop on. Right. Oh, uh, right. And, and yes. that's a tremendous incentive. Right. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, wean me off my car and whatever else I might do, including taxi cabs, which I think are slightly dangerous now, um, and onto a bus, uh, then make it free. Let me hop on the bus. So they were now, doing this in New York, okay? during the height of the pandemic because they did not want their drivers to be exposed. So they had the front where they had collect money, they had the front door closed and it was boarding only from the back doors and it was hop on, hop off basically. Now they're going back to, they've put some things in place where, so here's something else which I wanted to get to. But before we get to that, I just want to say that Japan, <laughs> it's a very interesting country, right? Uh, their public health campaigns placed particular emphasis on three things that can help you um, to, to avoid spreading the contagion, okay? So one was, you know, you wanna be away from closed spaces. So that was the first C. You wanna be away from crowded spaces and you want to not have conversation. So, so actually they don't want you to talk on the bus, you know? And maybe that's all right. Most of the time people don't know each other and they're not talking the bus, but they do talk on their phones and so on. So that's another thing is that just, I just thought that it was so, it was like, this will never fly here. You know, you can't tell people not to talk. You can barely tell them to wear masks. So we have a different culture, you know, and we need to figure out how we would tell people not to talk on the bus. <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, I just thought that was funny, but. Um, Let's look at the economics though. 
if I want to outfit a bus uh, with, you know, a different air uh, circulation system or a plane, you know, um, boy, it's going to cost some money. If I want to have more buses, you know, for fewer people on each bus right. or more planes, fewer people right. on each planes or right. fewer seats on a plane, that's going to cost a ton of money. And this is in a time, okay, when we don't have any money. And likewise, if I, if I want to build rail, true. Uh, okay, let me, I'll just finish, then you can respond. If I want to build rail, you know, it's costing a ton of money. If I say, wait, stop, I have another change order here. I want to change the air circulation system in the, in the rail cars. And I want to make sure that there's a capacity in every car so you guys don't get too close to each other. That's going to cost a ton of money. But no, no worry, because the city and county has so much money right now. It okay, so stop there because I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to barge in here because we do have money. We have CARES Act money that we can barely spend, all of us states, right? And why are we, so there are two, two big places where I can see the money. One is the CARES Act and you can start outfitting buses for, um, for air filtration systems. You can start doing things like putting driver compartments separate. You can put automated uh, fare collection at both doors, all of these things that we wanted to do as upgrades to buses. So even if we may not be able to actually buy a bus through CARES money, we can at least make them better. Okay, so that those are that's one thing. So that's one pot of money. Uh, the other one is remember, I was talking about that $64 billion vehicle economy. I think there needs to be this is a time of pandemic is a good time to rethink things. It's a good time to rethink. Is that where we want our public monies to go? And I'll tell you why I think it's really important to have a bus system. It's not just a bus system. It's, a, it's an essential service. You know that if you don't get the people, this is purely selfish. So I'll speak on it from a selfish as well as an altruistic standpoint. But if you're going to be really selfish for those people who say, I don't care about people getting from one place to another, I'm either staying put or uh, I'm gonna go in my car, right? So you're going to go in your car to the grocery store and you're going to find that none of the food has been taken off the pallets and put on the shelves, none of the toilet paper, none of the toothpaste, none of those things that you, the rich person in your rich car can go and buy, right? So you are stuck. So who's putting those things on? Who, who's loading up the unloading and loading at the grocery stores? I mean, those are essential items and those are people who are coming and in Honolulu, this is disproportionately, I think it's higher than average numbers nationally um, in Honolulu where people of lower income are using the bus to, to get to work. So, so this is really important for people. And now here's the more altruistic viewpoint, which is why should anyone have to, it's anyone that's living a life at a lower income, having to deal with so many other troubles, why should they also have to deal with the fact that now they have to wait an hour or two to get the bus and it's not more frequent for them and that they are also on the front lines where they are quote heroes you know we've we've sort of i feel like we've sort of um made ourselves feel better by saying oh you're a hero for helping me you know and really it's such a such a selfish um way of looking at things so so there is an, a huge equity component in this right um so that's the more sort of the the better place that we can be in after a pandemic. Yeah, let me, so a let me bus... add, it, it goes beyond facilitating the economy. It goes beyond facilitating essential workers. It goes beyond even climate change and, you know, making a sustainable environment. There's one other thing I want to mention it. Um, and that is, it's a sense of hope. We, we're, we're in a decline period. Our economy is declining. The number of cases nationally and locally too is increasing. Um, it's really a terrible time. And people do not see government stepping up. They're not, they're not encouraged and, and they're not you know, all excited about all the work that government is doing to save them and, and save their lives and their society. And if you build better buses, if you build a better transit transportation system, if you encourage, incentivize, make it easy, all the things we hoped to do before, you build hope. That's what we need now. I agree. And that's what actually cities are stepping up on this. So, you know, we are looking at New York having done uh, some excellent things around driver safety. We're looking at um, 
King County, as I mentioned, uh, looking at, and many other jurisdictions, these are just some examples. Internationally, here's what cities are doing because their subways can have more crowding than buses. Um, they are, Paris, for example, is building 400 miles of bike lanes to do where there were former car parking spaces. So they're taking away that from that vehicle economy, which benefits one person at a time and one generally richer person at a time as an alternative form of public transportation there to, or public, um, yeah, just transit, how to get from one place to another. They're using those bike lane, those parking lanes as bike lanes. They're using some of those as bus lanes. Um, Bogota is seeing this potential. Um, they have looked at, you know, uh, connecting residential neighborhoods by, by bikeable streets. Uh, Mexico City, Milano, Berlin. I mean, these are all doing, they're dramatically expanding their bike lane and that, the, that network mileage. So, and, and it's also a way of staying healthy. It's a way of avoiding coronavirus transmission. And they're also reducing the speeds uh, at which cars can travel, which is not a problem in Honolulu because, you know, we, <laughs> we don't ever, I usually, I make this joke that when I get off the ramp on the, high, on the highway, I, I actually get up to speed on that <laughs> off ramp. The 25, they're like, slow down to 25 miles. I'm like, yay, now I can go 25 miles. <laughs> True. So, so that's not a huge problem here, but it is a problem for, uh, for vehicle uh, related deaths and injury. So, um, well, let's assume that you and I agree absolutely on these principles um, and on the need to do this, um, you know, as, as we go forward, hopefully mm -hmm. to a better time. But tell me what's- Are you leaving me? Is this sounding like we're winding up? <laughs> uh, uh, no, yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. But, but we have a little time, a couple of minutes so anyway, to for you, you to answer my last question. So where do I start? Where, where do I start? Where do you start? Where does the government start to make it happen? Because otherwise it's aspirational. And you know, you and I know that aspirational is, you know, aspirational visions don't go anywhere. Um, we have to make it happen. Uh, which foot do I put out first? I say, uh, go, go look at your um, bike coalitions and your uh, folks that are advocating for equity and environmental justice on transit. Um, and just transportation in general. And I'd say help those folks advocate and do what they're asking you to do, which is get engaged right to your, to your legislators in Hawaii. Of course, this is easier. Uh, you can actually just go meet with them and they will listen. So when there are bills being put forward, um, you know, show up in maybe not in person, but in numbers uh, on Zoom or however they're taking testimony. So I would say that's where you put pressure on your government. Yeah, one of the things, this is a longer conversation, but I just, I want to throw this question at you is, is, you know, in this country, we have plenty of groups that are environmentally conscious uh, and, and they can speak, they can write, they can, you know, lobby, what have you. But at the end of the day, don't you agree that you need champions? You need champions in public office, in public official positions. Uh, to advance and advocate for this vis-a-vis -vis the government. Yes, and I think there are champions out there. We just, um, you know, I don't want to sort of name names and such, but there are definitely um, champions. And I think that's a, that's a great point. But, um, you know, I think that we need to look for um, a way, not in which, not just in how we can survive this pandemic, but just how we can thrive. And that's been a mantra I've been hearing, you know, it's like, how do we make it better than it was? Because what it was is not actually acceptable. Yeah. And so, yeah. so we really need to look at how do we flourish, right? After this, it's not just survival. Yeah, I totally agree. How do we realize the, uh, the hopes and expectations we, we could not achieve before for one reason or another? Maybe now is the time to reimagine that. Right, it's the carpe pandemicus, seize the pandemic. You heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> anu, <laughs> anu Hiddle, thank you so much. It, it's always great to have you on the show. I always a pleasure. Soon. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. You bye -bye. too. Bye.